Welcome to Ann Arbor Democracy, a place for conversation about how our local leaders are elected and how political decisions are made, what this looked like in the past and what it looks like now. This project aims to explore the recent history and current reality of Ann Arbor Democracy. In 1972, a progressive third party called the Human Rights Party, or HRP, elected two members to the Ann Arbor City Council, Jerry DeGreek from Ward 1 and Nancy Wexler from Ward 2. During their terms in office, both Jerry and Nancy came out as gay. In 1974, Jerry and Nancy finished their terms and decided not to run again. In City Council elections of 1974, the HRP fielded multiple candidates, but won just a single seat. In a historic first, Kathy Kozachenko campaigned openly as a lesbian and was elected to represent Ward 2. Also in 1974, Democrat Colleen McGee was elected as a city council representative for Ward 1, taking the seat previously held by Jerry DeGreek. What follows is part one of a conversation I had with Colleen McGee in December 2023. I'm Colleen McGee, and I was elected to council in 1974, and I served one term, which was two years at that time. So I unelected myself in 1976. And I'm so excited to talk to you today, Colleen, because I spoke to your predecessor about a year ago. Jerry. Yes. I took Jerry's seat. Yes. <laughs> So Jerry DeGreek famously served as a member of a third party, uh, Human Rights Party, on Ann Arbor City Council, and you served as a... Democrat. In fact, one of my favorite quotes is from the Ann Arbor Sun, where they said I was a reformer, not a revolutionary, but I would get the job done. Jerry had a dis uh, history somewhat similar to yours in having tried to run once before. If you can tell me a little bit about that, because that was, I presume that was the beginning of my involvement. Yeah. Right. Okay. So probably 1972-ish, Bob Favor was on council, was running for re-election, and was knocking on doors. And it was the first time in my life I'd ever talked to an actual campaigning politician. And I was just stunned that this council person was walking around my neighborhood talking to people. So I wandered over to the law school. A couple weeks later, they were having some, you know, cookies and tea or something, um, and started chatting up the Democrats and seeing what it was all about. So every 10 years, they redraw the boundaries in Michigan and in Ann Arbor based on the, the decennial census. And in 1973, we were still in the process of redrawing the ward boundaries. And if you look at the ward boundary maps previous to 73 and after 73, you'll see that before 73, the boundary goes straight down Hill Street, just like that. After that, you'll see that the boundary goes straight down Hill Street, then it drops down one block and goes over a block and comes up a block. A literal gerrymandering, where I would have been running against uh, Norris Thomas, who was a friend of mine from Legal Aid, and a black council member who served the northeast, you know, the the north side area. We filed for two different ward maps in that election. And so when the court finally came down and said, no, we're going to use the revised maps, I had filed petitions for the unrevised map, the 1960s map in 73. But when the court said, we're going to use the revised map, I said, nope, I'm not running against Norris. You know, you put me in against Norris, I'm not running. So that's why I have petitions in 73, but never actually showed up on the ballot because it was for a different ward system. I think I read accusations that it was trying to isolate the students or diminish their influence in city elections. Why, yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Strange that you should look at that kind of jiggery-jaggery. <laughs> Come to that conclusion. So now I, I have another question, which is about the election that you did end up running in. Okay. in so in 74, 
I, now, you lived somewhere else. I lived out uh, near the Northside School, just off Pontiac Trail. Gotcha. And um, so then how did, how, did, how did you come to decide to run in 74? Well, I already knew I was going to run at some point. It just, it wasn't going to be 73. I would have made the run in 73 if the ward boundaries had not put me against Norris. So, Did you decide to run before or after you knew that Jerry DeGreek wasn't running again? Oh, before. Oh, okay. I figured I was going to take on Jerry. Really? Oh, yeah. I thought I would have loved that. I, me and Jerry in an election going after each other? That would have been awesome. <laughs> well, I, this feels like a particularly special conversation because I know who you're talking about. <laughs> in, in a number of these conversations, we're talking about people I, I've not ever laid eyes on. Um, I mean, don't you think Jerry and I would have been a fun little conversation definitely. about who's going to suit this ward? Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, I was looking for, I was actually a little disappointed that he didn't run. What did the local Democratic Party look like then in terms of support for you or what kind of organization you it had behind you? It was an amazing community organization. The Democratic Party had dinner parties to raise funds, campaign funds for locals. Some of my best dinners were out of the Time Life cook books of various cuisines uh, and everybody would bring one dish and then you'd pay you know 20 bucks to come and eat good food and all that stuff anyway there was there were a lot of really good structural um, organizations in place and by the time I ran I had already been campaign manager for a couple school board members um, I had done a lot of work. Well, first of all, when I first got up here, I was working with the United Farm Workers because I was a union organizer uh, when I got here. And so I spent a couple years standing in front of the Kroger on Broadway, handing out leaflets, asking people not to buy grapes. And I had been an organizer when we put the People's Food Co-op together. I was part of the cashiers collective. We were a self-governed workers collective that uh, did the cashiering, um, and I had done a lot of other community organizing things. So the combination of community organizing and working as a campaign person and then manager for the Democrats, um, I had my campaign staff all picked out. I knew who I wanted. I already knew who did what well. Oh, and so I just said, please, can you do this? Can you do that? Can you, and just pulled together a team that, you know, let me not worry about the campaign and just go out and bash heads with Jerry only I didn't get to. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to rewind a bit because I forgot to ask you and I, I, I'm curious, how did you, how did you end up coming to town? So did you, did you grow uh, up in Ann Arbor or where no, are you no, from? No, no, no. Standard okay. grad student comes, never leaves kind of thing. Oh, okay. Um, in fact, there's an interesting quote, and I think I can find it. I said I was single and a student and a tenant when I first got here. Some council member had denigrated transients and that they shouldn't be allowed to vote and that sort of thing. And that was my response was, when did I become an acceptable member of this community? When I first got to Ann Arbor, and registered to vote, people who did not own real property were not allowed to vote in millage elections. You could not vote on taxation if you did not own property. That changed with a court decision uh, sometime in the late 60s, early 70s. But right in that period, I was not allowed to vote on school tax millages or anything else uh, because I was not a property owner. Ballot access has been an issue forever. Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose there's there's a logic to that, maybe? Well, the, the logic is, and it, it makes sense until you ask the next question. The logic is the property owner pays the taxes, they get to vote on how they're taxed. The real answer is, 
tenants pay those taxes in their rent. No property owner is paying the taxes and not passing it on to the tenants. So I have just as much vested interest in the millage rate and what those property taxes pay for as the owner themselves does. So when you were elected, when you were first elected in 74, um, you, when you were on council, and I had to look up this stat, um, you were one of four Democrats, and there were six Republicans. Stevenson was mayor, and Kathy Kozachinko was on council. And I, you and I talked a little bit earlier about this. When I'm looking up articles uh, to prepare for this conversation, I looked up your name at first, and I, you didn't appear in a whole lot of articles. And I realized Colleen and I have something in common because when I was on council, I didn't talk a lot either, and so I didn't I didn't make a lot of headlines. Um, Kathy did. <laughs> I, I'm curious, what did um, what was that? What was that like that first year when? The Republicans dominated, you had Stevenson as mayor, and what was that balance like? There was no balance. Kathy was ideologically opposed to consorting with Democrats or Republicans. Uh, she didn't distinguish positions. She didn't distinguish uh, ideology. She just, the mantra was, you know, they're all the same. They're all crooks or bad or, you know, whatever the opprobrium was. Uh, we were all the same and you couldn't distinguish. Um, and Kathy suffered from what I think was the final f real flaw of HRP policy decision making. Uh, there was a split. Leftists never can do things without splitting on ideological lines. Um, and some of the radicals were more pragmatic and some were less. And that's where the, the Sun endorsement came from, was that they saw me as maybe not pure, pure, ideologically pure, but certainly close enough that my pragmatism might actually get some of their policies enacted. Uh, and so they supported me instead of my HRP opponent. The HRP had a rule that their council people didn't vote independently. Their council people took to council the consensus uh, that had been arrived at on every item through tortuous meetings, caucus meetings on Sunday night. And I call it dem democracy by attrition. In other words, the final decision of how Kathy was going to vote might be decided at 2 o'clock in the morning by the last three standing members of the caucus who were still there wrangling over how to vote on this particular uh, I but, or, uh, agenda item. So uh, it much of what she had to do was based on three people who were still awake at 1.30 in the morning on Sunday night, uh, finally coming to consensus because everybody else had drifted off. I know that when we had a conversation a couple weeks ago, I asked you uh, if you ever flirted with the idea of getting involved with the HRP. Um, you obviously knew what was going on with the HRP. What was... Um... I'm a pragmatist. The, the Ann Arbor Sun was right. Um. <laughs> They were frustrated. They like the the article endorsing you was pretty damning of the HRP and pretty dismissive of it. Yeah. Yeah. It was a frustrating time to be a radical because they were so close to power um, and they couldn't quite wield it. So when you won your election, it was pretty close. Probably. Yeah. It was not not too many votes between you and um, Beth. Probably. Beth. Yes. You and Beth. Yeah. Did you get the student vote? Do you think that, did you, was your ward mostly, was that ward at that time a lot of students? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Remember, it's got the whole north side neighborhood. It's got the central, uh, north central neighborhood between Maine and Division. That's still all single family homes. Everything north of the river is pretty much single family homes. Uh, at least in my district, I ended at Pontiac Trail 
and everything west. So, so yeah, no. It, of course, there was a strong component. Uh, I would guess maybe 40, 50 percent of the ward was students, but 40 or 50 percent was not students. So uh, you couldn't you couldn't truly represent the ward if you didn't speak for and understand what your student constituents wanted. Mm -hmm. So well, in that ele that election, not only were you on the ballot, but there were also the the marijuana yes. ordinance and the rent control. And yeah. I I found several articles focused on what you did or didn't say about where you stood on rent control. That was really... one of the world's best life lessons. I have carried that lesson with me since I was, what, 27, 26, something like that. Um, which is, if you don't want to see it as a headline on the newspaper, don't do it or say it. Be able to stand behind whatever you've said or done when it sh when. It shows up on the front page. Um, I was trying to be nuanced and careful and, you know, cut careful. This is good, but this isn't. And then, um, doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Just say what you mean. <laughs> well, and the, so the, the plan that was on the ballot, it sounds like very detailed. So there was room for, for a lot to be parsed. Yes. And I could I could read between the lines, and I, I could feel where you were struggling and how challenging that must have been. Yeah. Uh, I think at one point I said it would have passed because it got 55% of, of the vote in support, and it would have had the other 20% if it had been better written. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing, but I'm pretty sure that 75 was probably the combined HRP and Democratic vote in my ward and that the fall that 20 percent fall off was because it was complicated and you didn't get to have a nuanced position you either voted it up or down and i was trying to be nuanced and careful and but it didn't pass no it didn't because it was too complicated mm -hmm. and the complications some of them were bad and then it got raised again when you were on council. So I, do you, what do you remember? What do you remember of how it was discussed later on council? You know, I don't remember. I remember it being very complicated and Al putting it off. And it just took forever to get anything. Um, and honestly, I think it was more fulfilling a campaign promise than any real sense that we could get a community because landlords are part of the community. Uh, and at that time, we had even more small landlords than we do now. You know, as a council member, you've got two jobs and it's hard to figure out which one to do when. You need to represent the people in your ward and you need to provide leadership to people in your ward. And sometimes it's hard to tell whether you just need to go against everything everybody believes and provide leadership on an issue, an ethical issue, or whether you need to be very careful to balance everybody's interests in order to come up with, you know, HRP wanted 100% consensus after working forever with consensus groups oriented groups. I'm happy with 90, 95% consensus. And we weren't even close on that, on the rent control ordinance. So ordinance as opposed to a uh, charter amendment. So the charter amendment went down. We tried to put in an ordinance. Um, it didn't pass. It We just couldn't craft anything that was uh, met enough interests to be representative. In part two, Colleen talks about the contested mayoral election of 1975, her work to strengthen the city's non-discrimination ordinance, and the discovery that her activism had attracted the attention of the FBI. Like and subscribe if you would like to be alerted to more content like this.